The events of 2020 have stirred my heart toward the Lord's coming. I've held an interest in Bible prophecy for a number of years, but when COVID-19 hit, it's like it just generated this deeper interest within me to study about the Lord's return. And in fact, that's what prompted me to begin this Return of Christ Bible study series. We are already in session nine, yet we still have so much to study. I have a page of different Bible verses that talk about the Lord's return, and I don't even think we've studied half of them. So today we're going to take a look at Revelation 22, in which Jesus says, I am coming soon. And he also says, I am the Alpha and the Omega etc. He lists out other descriptions and names referring to himself. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but the Bible teaches us to expect him at any moment. And the Lord himself spoke some very powerful words in Revelation 22, words that should impact each of us right now in the present. They should alter our perspective and make us more passionate about seeking first his kingdom, not our own. Let's listen to God's word as if Jesus is standing right in front of us, looking us in the eye, speaking to each of us one-on-one. So please turn to Revelation 22. I'm going to read some selected verses, verse 7, 12, and 13. And 16. Verse 7 Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Verses 12 and 13 Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth contained in this chapter. I'm so excited to teach. I am grateful for the way the Holy Spirit leads and and reveals truth that I wasn't even expecting. So God, I pray for these ladies that you would do the same for them, that their eyes would open in wonder as we study these verses in your word and learn more about Jesus' coming and who he is. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Look, I am coming soon. Jesus repeats this statement three times in this last chapter of scripture. And speaking of this chapter, I wish I could read all of Revelation 22 because it's quite beautiful. It describes the water of life as clear as crystal, and it presents the tree of life that bears 12 kinds of fruit. It tells how the Lamb's bondservants will see his face and have his name on their foreheads. I want to stop here just for a moment to point out, isn't it something how Satan always tries to deceive and imitate what God is doing. Because think about it. The Lord's bondservants will have his name where? On their foreheads. And where does the mark of the beast get placed on people during the tribulation? On the forehead or on the right hand? Satan is not very creative, (laughs) And even though he tries to imitate what God does, he always falls short. I just wanted to make note of that interesting point right here. Let's get back now. As far as what we learn in the early verses of Revelation 22, and it says in verse 5, the Lord God shall illumine them. It tells us that the Lord's bondservants will not need a light because the light will be the Lord himself. These are awesome sights and truths we will experience in the future. If you're weighed down by present circumstances, I encourage you to close your eyes. Just 
Take a deep breath and think about the amazing things God has in store for his people. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Be encouraged by the certainty of God's marvelous plans for us. Now let's get back to Jesus' words in verse 7. First he says, I am coming soon. Then he adds that every person who keeps the words of the prophecy written in Revelation is blessed. Now when you look at the Greek word for our English word keep, you'll discover various definitions. And depending which one you choose, you can arrive at a slightly different understanding for verse 7. In regard to Revelation 22, 7, Vine's Expository Dictionary defines the word keep, and I quote, to observe, to give heed to, as of keeping commandments, etc., end quote. This definition implies obedience. However, in regard to some of the other verses that contain the Greek word for keep, Vine's Expository Dictionary defines it to keep, to guard, Personally, I prefer attaching this meaning to Revelation 22.7 because I think it makes more sense in the context. For example, I was struggling as I was thinking about what are the commands in the book of Revelation. It just doesn't come across to me as a book full of commands. And then I found an article by Rosemary Bardsley at godswordforyou.com where she pointed out that aside from Jesus' commands to the seven churches, there are few commands in Revelation. She also commented on Revelation 22.7, and I found her insights on Jesus' words, as well as the word keep, to be very helpful. She wrote, and I quote, He is commanding us to place extreme value on his word, to hold it as a precious treasure of immense value. Here in Revelation 22, 7, Jesus is affirming the blessedness of all who so value and so hold tightly to the words of this prophecy, end quote. I can attest to this blessing in my own life. God's prophetic words in Revelation are very meaningful to me. I don't ignore them or take them lightly. I believe them. And by valuing God's prophetic word, I experience blessing. Even with all the chaos and uncertainty in our world today, God blesses me with peace and comfort because his word reveals what to expect. I certainly don't understand everything perfectly, but I know Jesus is coming back for us, his bride, and that helps me so much in these troubled times. I want to commend each of you, too, for your desire to learn more about Bible prophecy. Because according to Jesus, it's a worthy subject. Now, let's move on to verse 12. Jesus says again, I am coming soon. Obviously, he felt the need to emphasize this point. He knows how prone we are to forgetfulness, especially when we think something is taking a long time to happen. But remember what we learned last time about God's view of time? It came from our passage in 2 Peter. 1,000 years are like one day to God. And it hasn't even been a full 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead. We can rest assured that everything is going along according to God's plan for Jesus' return. The Lord is also aware of our tendency to get absorbed in the concerns of this world which takes our eyes off of his soon return. So Jesus' repeated statement makes it very clear he's coming soon. Or, as the outline of biblical usage defines the Greek word, Jesus is coming without delay. He's bringing his reward, too. Every Christian will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, where the Lord will reward us for the work we did for him while we lived on earth. Please note This is not a time when the Lord will judge us for our sins. He already endured our judgment for our sins when he died on the cross. The judgment seat of Christ is a place where Jesus will express pleasure 
for every single thing we've done for him. He'll reward us for each one. At blueletterbible.org, Don Stewart wrote, and I quote, The judgment seat of Christ is not designed to punish believers, but rather to reward them for their faithful service. All of us will give an account of what we have done after trusting Christ as Savior. Therefore, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of believers' works after salvation. End quote. It matters what we do for the Lord. It matters how we spend our time. And as Pastor Kenny Mills preached recently, it matters why we do it. In other words, our heart's motivation for doing what we do is key. God sees our hearts and he knows whether we're serving him for the right reason. Let's serve God wholeheartedly now so Jesus will have lots to reward us for when he returns. In verse 13, Jesus identifies himself in three ways, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and the beginning and the end. All of these terms emphasize Christ's eternal state, but each one also reminds me of special aspects about the Lord. This is where this study, as I was preparing, got really fascinating because I was not anticipating the depth of what I was going to discover in this verse. So just listen to to these thoughts. First of all, the Alpha and the Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Connect this description with the fact Jesus is the Word made flesh. We're told that in John 1, verse 14. The next term, the first and the last, brings to mind Jesus' position as the firstborn of all creation, which we read about in Colossians 1, 15. In regard to Jesus being the firstborn, listen to this explanation from gotquestions.org, and I quote, The word firstborn signifies priority. In the culture of the ancient Near East, the firstborn was not necessarily the oldest child. Firstborn referred not to birth order, but to rank. The firstborn possessed the inheritance and leadership. Therefore, the phrase expresses Christ's sovereignty over creation. Finally, the phrase recognizes him as the Messiah. End quote. As far as Jesus being the last, 1 Corinthians 15.45 refers to him as the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Adam brought death, but Jesus gives life. The last term, the beginning and the end, also conveys special truth about Jesus. In a note about Revelation 3.14, which names Jesus as the beginning of the creation of God, Spiros Zodiades, the editor of the Keyword Study Bible, wrote, and I quote, The word beginning in this instance is not used as the result of God's creation, but the cause of God's creation, end quote. Finally, we understand Jesus as the end. Listen to Romans 10.4, which reads, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ perfectly fulfilled the law of the Old Testament and ushered in the new covenant by his blood. Romans 6.14 tells us we're not under the law, but under grace. We're made righteous by believing in Christ. I want to stop for a minute here and say If you are watching this video and you are not 100% certain that you have believed in Jesus Christ and that you are saved, I invite you to do it right now. You can pray, and I'm not going to supply those words. I believe the Holy Spirit will lead you. The important thing is to place your faith in Christ. He died on the cross, and on the third day, he rose again. He died for your sins and my sins. And he is alive now, seated at God's right hand. 
He died to give you life. And because of his death and by your faith in him, you can be forgiven of your sin and given eternal life. Won't you trust Jesus and receive him as your savior right now? For the rest of us, you can take another deep breath of relief and smile because our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is absolutely, unequivocally amazing. And he has done amazing, eternal things for us. Let's move on to verse 16, in which Jesus explains he sent his angel to communicate the information in the book of Revelation to the churches. Who are the churches? That's us. As I mentioned before, learning the truth about Bible prophecy brings peace and gives comfort. We don't need to lay awake at night worrying about the judgment that's coming on the unbelieving world. Our Savior is coming back for us before the tribulation. This does not mean we won't suffer, but we can hold on to the truth of Christ's soon return. And while we wait, we need to be busy sharing the gospel, plus praying for unsaved loved ones. Until Jesus comes, let's make every effort to expand his kingdom. Now, we also see two more descriptions or names for Jesus in verse 16. He says he's the root and the offspring of David. I believe this clarifies his authenticity as the Jewish Messiah, plus his right to reign on David's throne. Jesus is the anointed one, the deliverer God promised to the Israelites thousands of years ago. He's a physical descendant of King David and the rightful heir to David's throne. Jesus also is the bright morning star. I absolutely love this name for Jesus. It has such powerful and beautiful imagery. Randy Alcorn writes at Christianity.com, and I quote, On a long, dark night, the appearance of the morning star means daybreak is imminent. In the long, dark night of suffering on earth, Jesus being seen as the morning star means the eternal morning is about to dawn. Hence, Christ as the morning star is a picture of great promise and hope. End quote. Don't you love that? Maybe you needed to listen to this entire lesson just to grab hold of this name of Jesus being the bright morning star. Allow the light of Christ to just cast off any darkness that is clutching you in its grip. Jesus is the bright morning star. And we're going to end today's study on that note. Originally, I planned to cover verses 17 and 20 as well. But the Holy Spirit redirected me. So I'm going to leave you in suspense Lord willing, when we meet again on July 30th for session 10, we'll study Revelation 22, verses 17 and 20 and 21. Until then, remember that Jesus, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the root and descendant of David, and the bright morning star, he is coming soon. I just want to close out this session by thanking you for studying the Bible with me. And if you're a first time viewer, I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel and clicking the like button, which will help this video get out to more people. I'd appreciate your help with that. So thank you very much for being here. May the Lord bless you. Jesus Christ is coming soon.